Hi, for everyone joining, uh, this is Congressman Pete Aguilar from California's 31st District here in the Inland Empire uh, as part of an ongoing effort to give you information on what is happening uh, here on the ground. Uh, we wanted to invite some uh, guests and uh, we are joined today by Mike Daniel, who is the uh, Regional Director of the Inland Empire Orange County uh, Small Business uh, Development Center Network, and uh, Mike is himself a business owner uh, as well, uh, over 10 years experience in this space, and uh, I've had the privilege to be on a number of uh, calls uh, with Mike, and he's just a, really a regional expert when it comes to this, and so we just wanted to have a conversation about some of the existing programs that, uh, that the Inland Empire and that Southern California is utilizing uh, and to see what uh, what else, what other resources we should be thinking through, uh, and what are some of the kind of frequently asked questions that uh, that people have of him uh, and of and of me as well. Uh, Mike, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, Congressman, for for including me in this. And so my name is Mike Daniel. I'm the regional director for the Small Business Development Center, which is a grant funded program from the SBA. Um, we've been around for more than 40 years, offering one-on-one -on -one consulting services and training to small business owners that are looking to start, grow, and exit. And we really are the, the small business technical assistance program from the federal government, um, helping, helping support small business owners. And then on the other side, I own a couple of uh, Rocky Mountain chocolate factories and a sugar daddy sweet shop in Long Beach and Huntington Beach. So thank you for, thank you for having me on. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about the organization in your group. And I know uh, you mentioned uh, you guys have been uh, funded uh, through SBA. And you've been a partner uh, over the years with them. You know, why don't you talk to me and back up a little bit and and tell me kind of what uh, problems you helped businesses with. Uh, you know, maybe in in last December and January and all of last year. You know, what what was kind of typical of the resources you would provide uh, before uh, the pandemic, uh, and then we'll get into some of the new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're really positioned to help businesses as they're going through the startup phase and looking to figure out how to start a business, whether it be a brick and mortar, a home-based business, um, and, and really getting them through all of those different pieces. We have about 100 consultants spread through eight centers. So in, in San Bernardino County, we have um, Cal State San Bernardino, we have University of California Riverside helping in the, in the technology-focused areas, and the County of Riverside, they run our three centers for, for the Inland Empire really helping people do those things, right? So if it's a tech-based company looking for startup capital, we're helping them get angel investment, helping them get VC capital and, and aligning their services that way. If people are looking for funding, which is really why we exist, is to help people package loans and then go find them the lenders, right? Obviously the hardest thing around any business is, is access to capital. Uh, but then do I incorporate my business? Do I stay a sole proprietor? How do I hire employees? How do I do all those things? That's really where we fit um, prior to really the COVID-19 uh, disaster, you know, and, and then post, oh yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, 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 I was just gonna say, so so post disaster declaration and kind of what the position we find ourselves in now, uh, Congress uh, stood up one new program, uh, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, and then, uh, kind of uh, supersized, I guess, the, the EIDL uh, program uh, to, to infuse more money. So talk to us a little bit about the advice that you were giving, um, you know, maybe last month as folks were kind of deciding uh, which path to take, or many of them, I think the answer is, is both. Yeah, absolutely. And we were helping people through the Paycheck Protection Program, through the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, just understanding what they were, how they could utilize them, because they are two very different programs. One is very short term, and one is very long term. So helping them understand how to apply for it. We have a daily call every day uh, at three o'clock with the SBA disaster office and our team. And we're averaging between 750 and 1,000 business owners every single day on that call. Um, so if you're interested, I'll get you the information so that you guys can join in as well as ever listening to this. Um, we really want to be the informational piece so people understand what funding is available for them. If their business has been shut down, if they got into a skeleton crew, that's where we fit helping you, one, understand that, and then really helping you one-on-one -on -one with that because everybody's everybody's situation is slightly different. Yeah, so where do where do nonprofits fit into this? Um, they're they're allowed to qualify for for PPP up to up to five hundred. You know, in your conversations with community organizations and nonprofits, you know, where do they think that they fit in, and and what resources do they find most useful? Yeah, and so interesting. You know, our our charge really is to help for-profit businesses because we we really are the arm for the through the SBA with technical assistance. Um, this is the only time that we help nonprofits. So as we're helping them, it's really around capital. It's, can I apply for the economic injury disaster loan? How do I do that? How do I qualify? What's the paperwork and all of that? 
Um, and then the same thing with the Paycheck Protection Program. It's how do I get through it? What do I qualify for? Who signs for it? Because that's obviously the issue with a 501c3, 501c19. If I'm a 501c6, why don't I qualify? And then if there's other, other, other funding options, right? So as the state of California has launched a new program, you have counties getting involved, you have cities getting involved. There's a lot of different funding options available to both for-profit and non-profit. Our role is to help them figure out where and then how to get it. What's your advice to those local leaders? You know, the, the count, Orange County, San Bernardino County is looking at creating uh, a fund now uh, as well. You know, where can, where can local government, you know, also play a role in to kind of fill in some of the gaps? What are some of the areas that make the most strategic sense for them to, to get involved? Yeah, I mean, and it's still capital. And to give you some examples, you know, we've, we've helped several cities um, re, re, redistribute um, community on the block grant funds or CDBG funding that comes from Housing and Urban Development or HUD. Um, and so cities are able and counties to redirect that to grant programs and loan programs. To give you a couple of examples, um, we're getting ready to launch one with the city of Buena Park for commercial, commercial businesses with 10 or, 10 or fewer employees. It's $10,000 grant. Um, for the city of Anaheim, the $10,000 loan, um, very similar, similarly based, but it's forgivable. Um, with the county of San Bernardino, we're helping them right now have those conversations of can we start a, a loan program or a grant program? How do we stand that up? Um, and then working with, with community-based lenders, um, getting them involved in funding opportunities. Um, and that's, that's where we want to fit. We're able to get a couple lenders, community development financial institutions, some, some additional funding that they can do specific work in the three county area that we cover, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Um, it's, it's making sure that things are available. Um, but then the other biggest piece is information. Um, and the hardest part, I think, for, for our three county region is that most of our information comes from the city of LA. Right? We watch the news and it's the city of LA and we hear this information and think that that's us, but it's really, it's when, when the mayor of LA says, hey, we, we can't go back to business as usual yet. Well, that's not necessarily the case for San Bernardino and Orange County and Riverside. We can possibly at this moment in time, getting ready to go into phase two. Um, you know, so it's making sure that we, we have the right places to, to get that information. So whether it's coming directly from the county, directly from your office, or directly from our office, it's specific to the region. Yeah, it's a good point. We hear that all the time. You know, people just kind of frustrated with, you know, uh, they may like the mayor of LA, but, but, you know, how does this 65 miles away, how does this matter to, to me and my business and, and what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish? Yeah. Uh, one of the criticisms of the uh, PPP program initially with the kind of first round uh, was that it didn't go across to Main Street. It, it didn't go into our communities. Um, there, it seemed to be that it was kind of a cozy relationship. Uh, it was kind of ones and twos that of people who had benefited from it. And, and it seemed that those were folks who were, you know, maybe bigger, maybe had private banking relationships. Uh, Congress went back, we added more resources. We specifically, you know, put buckets of funds in for small asset organizations and CDFIs. Is it, is it making a difference? What are we seeing? What are you hearing now? from folks who were applying or had their applications in previously um, and, are, and are now hearing back. Yeah, it, it absolutely is making a huge difference. So first of all, thank you. You know, I think, I think the greatest part about the round two is that um, leadership understood the problem and fixed it quickly. And, and keep in mind, I mean, this program was created in seven days, right? I mean, and to get the amount of money, I mean, there, there currently now are over 3 million businesses that have been touched with either Paycheck Protection Program or, or Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That is an amazing amount of business that has been touched already in, what are we, I mean, we're talking 45 days from, from that. I mean, so for government to work that fast, I mean, I think, one, I, I know that everybody is in a sense of panic, but you kind of got to look at the bigger picture and say, there's been a tremendous amount of people touched by this. Um, but back to the, the Paycheck Protection Program specifically, um, the first round, the average, the average loan size was $175,000. So that's a payroll of roughly... $70,000, $75,000 a month in payroll. That, that's not Main Street business, right? Main Street business is $5,000, $10,000, maybe $15,000. It's a small mom and pop, you know, hamburger stand. It's, it's a candy store. It's an insurance broker. I mean, it, it's a dry cleaner. I mean, those, their payrolls are much smaller. So their, their loan amounts are thirty dollars to $50,000. And we have seen a tremendous amount of those uh, funded in the second round. And the great thing, I mean, I just got an email from, from SBA today. There's still over over hundred billion dollars left in this fund, you know, for people to access. So it didn't go it didn't go that fast, and so people can still get into it. So I think the biggest concern is yes, three million businesses has have been touched by this, but there are thirty million small businesses in the United States, right? So ten percent have roughly gotten some funding. Why are the other you know twenty seven million businesses have they not been affected, or they're either not getting through or don't realize that they can apply for this? I think that's probably more the latter stage because. 
uh, of that 30 million small businesses, 80% of them are five employees or fewer. And of that 80%, 50% of them are just a single, single operator. So you need to make sure that they realize that they can apply for these funds and receive them. Yeah, I think that's been something that we've heard loud and clear too, or the single operators and the under fives, you know, some of them don't have sophisticated, you know, business, you know, banking accounts. And so they don't, they don't know where to go. Um, so I think that's a, that's absolutely a key point where we can continue to give them information and, and guide them to the resources. So, so what, what's next? What else could we do? You know, if, if we, you know, do, we still have these resources left, a hundred billion dollars left to loan. If Congress goes back, you know, should we, should we think it lengthening the program? Should we think about additional investments in CDFIs to kind of reach those, you know, under five employee groups? You know, what should be some of the policy priorities we should focus on to reach the, the you know, the, the 27 you know, million more businesses who haven't been touched? Yeah, and that is such a great question. And, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program in its thought process is an amazing program, right? To help people keep, keep people in business and, and keep their employees going. The hard part for California was we were shut down so quickly that this program actually was created after most of, this, most of the businesses in California had been closed. So to bring people back was difficult. Um, I, to me, in my mind, the next, the next round or the next stage is really the recovery stage, right? We're in survival. We're slowly starting to open up our businesses. Phase two is going into effect starting tomorrow. Um, and then phase three, hopefully in the next week or two, which will be beauty salons, gyms, things like that, we'll be able to hopefully get back to business. Obviously, it will never be business as usual, at least for a long period of time. But what does is, what is a next kind of stimulus package look like around recovery, right? So as I'm ready to reopen, how do I pay my rent, right? And so for a lot of businesses in California, especially in our territories, um, maybe there was a moratorium on, for 90 days. Well, that's great to push that back for 90 days, but that day 91 comes, and now all of a sudden I owe four months of rent. How am I going to cover that, right? And when rents are already so high, or how do I bring my payroll and bring my people back? And, and that, that's another big issue. Um, a lot of employees for Main Street businesses, restaurants, retail, hospitality, um, when they're making $25 an hour on unemployment, when you take unemployment and then the pandemic unemployment assistance, which again, is an amazing program and, and a great opportunity to make sure that our employees are taken care of, but they don't necessarily want to come back to that $15 an hour job until that is exhausted on the other end. So how do we hire our employees back? So unintended consequences sometimes of trying to do, the, do great things um, leads to us, you know, as, as employers get back in business and want to hire their employees, they don't want to come back yet. Right, right. Where, where, does, where do we go from here? If, if phase two, you know, uh, kicks in and we're allowed to, to kind of get to that benchmark, you know, what does it even look like for, for businesses? This isn't a complete, you know, snapback and there's lots of, you know, data that shows consumers are going to be very, very cautious themselves about, uh, about shopping, about the experiences. Um, and and uh, so what will that look like for foot traffic and retailers uh, like yours and business owners? You know, what can we expect to see out of this region? Yeah, and I think over the next three to six months, you're going to see a lot of uncertainty. You're going to see new customer norms that, that you're not used to seeing. I mean, I have some, some great examples of restaurants. So what does that look like at half capacity, right? And so when I have a 100 seat capacity and I can only bring 50 people in at a time, how am I going to do that? Um, and then if no one wants to touch a menu, how do, I, how do I all of a sudden implement technology to I can now order off my phone, I can pay off on my phone. There's going to be norms that people need to, you know, move move their business to the next generation and that's going to be a big deal for retail i mean how many how many people are going to want to go in and try on a shirt try on a sweater and put it back and then how does a how does a retailer a retail business owner take care of that once they've tried it on or talk about a yoga studio right so you have a nine o'clock class with 20 people coming into it well when that 10 o'clock class comes in how do i sanitize my business so people feel safe in, in that environment and so i you know i don't you know what we're trying to help our people understand is if business comes back to 25% of what it was last year, what does that look like, right? Can I survive? What are just my fixed expenses? If it comes back to 50%, so I need to have an, possibly an online presence if I'm a brick and mortar. I need to understand, you know, how to get new, 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 new revenue streams that I didn't have prior or I can't get my inventory, right? I mean, I have a couple of chocolate stores. Well, what happens if I can't get chocolate, right? I don't have anything to sell. And I think that is going to hit people next. And then the biggest issue is how do I take care of my employees? And, and how do I provide, what is the proper PPE um, to provide for them? And then at the same time, you know, one thing I think that you, you're going to have to start thinking about as well is the liability side for a business owner. Am I liable for my, for my employees if they come back and get sick? Am I liable for my customers and clients if they come in and get sick? And the insurance companies really haven't weighed in on this. And so I, I think that's the missing gap right now is, is there's no understanding. There's no 
black and white rule of here's what I have to do. I have to get more insurance, I have to do X, Y, and Z. No one has come out and said that. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty for, for business owners as to what to do next. And that uncertainty is gonna, gonna translate to their behavior, right? To, to going you know, slower than, than uh, they, they maybe can or um, you know, having conversations and uh, uh, investing in capital uh, for their shops to, to put in the, the resources. So those types of things, that, uh, that uncertainty is, uh, is a barrier at times. Will, what will retail look like? I mean, you kind of talked about it a little bit, uh, you know, here in the Inland Empire uh, and just, you know, in the news, we have these retailers who have, you know, filed bankruptcy. Um, some would say, you know, retailers had concerns before the pandemic. Um, uh, but what does that look like uh, for, for our regions that we do have, you know, a little bit more land than, than some of the more uh, urban areas across the country? Uh, and uh, so what will that experience you know, look like in, in, in the next, you know, 10 to 20 years? Is this going to shape our, our shopping habits? Yeah, and it, and it was already kind of changing that, that landscape as we spoke. I mean, you, you saw a lot, of, a lot of shopping experiences wanting to be more customized, more curated, you know, much more unique. And so you saw smaller retailers getting into different, different locations. You saw a lot of online, obviously, with Amazon and Walmart and all these bigger, bigger box stores kind of taking, taking market share away from from what was traditionally the malls that we would go to probably as kids, right? And, and so as we're starting to see malls with 500, 600,000 square feet of vacant space, I think you're gonna see, at the time prior to COVID, you started to see a lot more entertainment coming into those spaces. But what is entertainment gonna look like as we move to the future as, you know, whether it be, I don't wanna provide any necessary names, but Disney Plus and Netflix and, and things like that are gonna take on additional meaning. Um, I think you're gonna see these big, these big box retailers have to really redefine themselves. They're not, I mean, they just can't carry that type of inventory and have that expense anymore. And I think for the smaller retailers, I mean, as we open our shops tomorrow, um, it's, you know, it's literally, they're gonna walk to the door and order from there. Um, so that experience is going to change dramatically. And so how do I have less, but better quality, right? And I think that's what we possibly could be moving into for a lot of, a lot of businesses is to really kind of redefine what their shops look like and to really just stress and focus on those things that are what people actually want versus having a much bigger variety. What are some of the indicators that you're looking at as we as we kind of progress through this? What are some things that you want to see out of our region, you know, specifically uh, to hit the next benchmark or to know that you know we're ready for uh, either the next phase or or uh, additional you know, government help? You know, what are some of the things that you keep an eye on? Yeah, I mean, I would say first and foremost, it's the number of businesses that begin to reopen, right? So if you look at that. You know, I mean, there's been estimates of up to, you know, 5% of the businesses reopen. Well, if that's the case, I mean, imagine every other location closed or every other office space closed, you know, and, and this, this goes beyond just brick and mortar. I mean, think about dentists, right? They, they're not able to work right now. So you have hygienists that don't have jobs. You have high skilled, high wage jobs that people can't go back to. You have dent, uh, uh, doctor's offices that general practitioners that aren't open. Um, this is interesting time and I think it's how many people go back to work. It's, it's what does unemployment look like? Unemployment is a very interesting number right now because it's everybody. But what is it going to look like in six months? What is it going to look like in three months, right? As businesses reopen and this pandemic unemployment assistance goes away, are people going to migrate back? Are, I think we're also going to look at our colleges and universities. Are people going back to school to re-educate themselves into different careers? And typically when you see times like this and times of recession, um, you, you, you typically see people go back to school to re-educate themselves. And, and I think you're going to see a big push back into the educational sectors. Interesting. So you think that those will, will see, you know, spikes in, in enrollment and, and, you know, continued progress moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and but yet in a changing time, right? I, I work out of Cal State Fullerton, um, you know, and as we're going to virtual, we have, we're the largest CSU in the system. Cal State San Bernardino is right behind us uh, as far as size wise. You know, we have, 40,000 students that go to the school here. Cal State San Bernardino is 35,000. Um, are people going to want to come back to school? What does distance learning look like? And, you know, and as we're talking about students taking a gap year, not necessarily wanting to come back or going to a community college because it's a little less expensive. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how all this plays over the next six months where there's just, I think there's just so many unknowns. I mean, I've never, I mean, obviously we've never lived through a time like this where everything is up in the air. Everything is being, everything is being touched by, by this uh, pandemic. Mike, what, one other question that we've received from folks who are kind of sole proprietors um, is kind of weighing whether they should use, for the first time ever, uh, state unemployment um, uh, is available for them, you know, during the pandemic as well. You know, people who uh, 
barbers and and you know stylists and those and those folks who have never done this before, you know, as you counsel folks who maybe you know a one person shop, you know, on on the path to reopening and and which route they should go to, you know, what are some of the common questions or things that that come up often in their minds? Yeah, I mean, the first question is, do how do I even qualify for it, right? And so. Uh, people absolutely qualify, and, and my my I guess I go right back to you need to take care of your family first, right? So whatever that means, and whatever means necessary to take care of them. So if your business is closed or your sales aren't worth you being there, you know you're going to get six hundred dollars of pandemic unemployment assistance, and then you're going to get some other form of unemployment insurance up to you know whatever you qualify for up to four hundred fifty dollars a week. That's a thousand dollars a week. That take it if you absolutely need it, right? And and if you're not making that in your business, maybe it's time to shut it down in the short term. To, to reopen it in the long term, uh, you got to take care of your family first. And and just you know to go back to the EDD a little bit. One, it's 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 daunting, right? I mean, you have four million people applying for unemployment. The EDD wasn't prepared for this, and how could they be, right? And so you can't get through to anybody. You don't know if your stuff went through. Some people are getting payments. I know that the state of California had to ask, you know, had to be had to ask for for a loan from the federal government to pay this. Um, so it, it's daunting. I just don't give up. Right? I would say that's that's the biggest issue. I mean, I get that it's it's hard to be patient, it's hard to be, but just continue to kind of push through that. If you need help, I will help you through that. That's what our program exists for. Um, and then as you're going through EDD, just, just remember that for a sole proprietor, independent contractor that didn't pay into the system originally, it's um, the biggest thing that we're finding is that people are expecting to get paid off of their their gross wages. It's actually off of their net. That's that's the nuance to something that hadn't paid into the system. It's off of net, so that payment might be a lot smaller than you originally thought. Um, so let us help you figure that out um, if, if that's something that you want to go through. Got it. But you've been counseling folks like that, even those sole proprietors you've been, who have been coming through your doors, you've been answering their questions and helping them, you know, with all that information. Absolutely. And, and, and the economic entry disaster loan, although it's not open at this moment, most likely it's going to reopen uh, again. That is a great loan and a great option for people at, for long-term growth, right? To get you through the next six months, two years, five years. We don't know when this is going to change, if ever. Right? If, if we're ever going to go back to what we would consider normal prior to February 15th. Um, but you know, look at the different options that you have available. I mean, there's the State of California loan program. There's, you know, in, in your backyard, you have AMPAC, DEC. They're, they're doing the Paycheck Protection Program through the second round. They still have funding available. They have some great, great loan programs as well. There is funding options available. And I, I know for a, most small business owners, they've never taken a loan. It scares them. They don't necessarily want it. You might need it. It's, it's all about survival right now. So whatever it takes to survive and then recover, it's really what we need to, to be thinking through. That's great. I appreciate it. Any other uh, comments or thoughts before we, uh, before we wrap up? You know, I would just say, you know, we are building recovery pro plans for, for, end for businesses as they go through this, and they are different for everybody. Um, you need to kind of sit down. You need to understand your employees and regulations. Um, you need to understand the four phases of business and when you can possibly reopen. You need to understand and talk to your employees if you have them, if they're willing to come back, have that conversation now. Um, talk to your, your insurance broker and find out, am I covered if I bring my employees back? Am I covered if a customer fa falls on my business? Yes, we know that, but we don't know if they get sick and they claim that they got COVID in our, in our place of business. Are, how are we covered? Um, but seek assistance. You know, the federal government has a lot of programs, including us you know, and, and many other programs that they pay for um, to make sure that we're here to help businesses. Seek us out, you know, ask for help. It's, it's okay. Everybody needs help right now. Um, so I would say, you know, give us a call, contact the congressman's office. You know, they, they have our number as well or many other resources available. But don't, don't think that you're in this alone because we're all in this together. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that, Mike. That theme, uh, you've been incredibly generous on a bunch of calls uh, that, that we've been on. Uh, you're always uh, very willing with your time to help guide folks through this. So we really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing uh, at the Inland Empire Small Business Development Center Network uh, of Orange County and Inland Empire. Uh, you guys play a key role in, in guiding businesses, and, and we thank you for, for all the contributions. Um, for folks who are interested and who have additional questions, uh, please feel free to leave them in, in comments here. Sign up for our newsletter. Visit our website, uh, angular.house.gov. Uh, we'll put uh, Mike's organization and the contact information uh, there as well for folks uh, to, to benefit from. Uh, Mike, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the dialogue and the, and the discussion. Thank you, and thank you for everything you're doing for us. So We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Mike.